back again for another edition of Code for Conversations. How you doing, bro? Man, I'm good, man. I'm good. Good, good, good. Glad to be here joining you all again. And we have with us today a very special guest, a Dallas native, someone who has served in the for-profit uh, world in the state of Texas, as well as in California, served in the nonprofit world. Uh, this brother is a public theologian, as well as a uh, writer, uh, who of course uh, provides a weekly commentary quit plan which many of you all are probably familiar with uh, writing in the Dallas Weekly and then of course serves also uh, in the city of Dallas. He is none other than Mr. Vincent Hall. How you doing today? I'm, I'm just privileged to be here with you Dr. Durr. You know um, Durr always makes these wonderful introductions uh, and he deserves the most because he's one of the most astute well-read brothers I've, I, I know and another brother I'm sitting here with that has been in Dallas for a long time and always been around the struggle, always in it. So I'm just happy to be between two real brothers. Well, we're glad to have you uh, and glad to have what we know is uh, a conversation that we've been having because obviously when me and DeMond uh, came over to the conversation that you helped uh, moderate between uh, Commissioner Price and Jim Schultz and uh, was it John Fullenweiler? John Fullenweiler. Was at that conversation when we were talking <laughs> about the accommodation and so, uh, so we've been talking obviously a lot around just Dallas um, as a city where we are as a country but also our need to engage in civic literacy and obviously mm -hmm. you have a interesting history in terms of providing leadership in our community yeah. but also providing leadership in the corporate world but also being someone uh, who is an activist but before we get into all of those details about yeah. the uniqueness of your life I want you to as we do this is Sankofa yeah. so we start first with everybody's personal Sankofa moment so we go forward by looking behind you understand you understand <laughs> so give us some of your background you know I was I was born uh, in Dallas Texas I was born uh, uh, basically, went home to the Parsonage of Goodwill Baptist Church, my grandfather, Reverend Z.R. Figures. Uh, born at Parkland Hospital. You know, it's funny because um, the other day when I joined the Parkland Board of Managers, uh, we had a conversation. They were saying, well, give us a little bit about your background. I said, I was born at Parkland Hospital. Mm -hmm. I'm probably the only board member you've ever had that was mm. born at Parkland Hospital. Because when I was born in 1958, you couldn't be born anywhere else. Mm. In 59, when my brother was born, he was born at Parkland because he couldn't be born anywhere else. Mm. 62, my mother was working for Baylor, but my daughter was, bought, was born in Parkland. Mm. So let me and ask so, a question for you. Sure. Which Parkland? The the, the 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 parking that they just demolished. Okay. Oh, okay. Right. Not the old one. <laughs> Not the old one. Not the old one. So uh, I was born uh, in, in Dallas, um, went to a lot of different uh, elementary schools. My mother, for the most part, was a single mother with four children, and we moved like almost every summer. You know, mm -hmm. I went to first grade in uh, Denison, which is right up the street. Uh, about 90 miles. It, it used to seem like a long way, but they put Plano and right. Allen in between right. it now. Mm. It's That's not right. that far drive. Mm. Um, came back and went to William Brown Miller, to Roger Q. Mills, to uh, Paul L. Dunbar, um, um, Bowster, and then on to Skyline High School. But uh, Dallas has always been my home. Uh, my grandfather was a preacher, and he was well known in the community. <clears throat> my my paternal parents, uh, my grandfather and my father, they were more of the kind of street-like kind of guys. Okay. You know? I, I don't tell them lies about that. Um, I, I learned a lot about, you know, hard sixes and, mm. and uh, you know, bet they come the whole mm. nine yards <clears throat> from them. And there were two different types of people, mm. but there's a lot to be learned on both sides. Mm. In fact, I tell people all the time, I probably learned more from the hustling side than I did from the church side. Mm. Because hustlers keep it real. Right. And uh, as we, as, as the years have gone on, I realize that being real is not only what, what uh, is best, but it's what this, this generation demands. Mm. So <clears throat> learned, I know a lot of people in Dallas, I always have. Um, I, probably, I probably got my baptism into uh, the, what I call the liberation movement mm. uh, at 15, my first year at, uh, at uh, Skyline High School, mm. uh, 1973. Um, I had never been to a school with white people at all. Until then? Until then. Mm. The whole first through ninth grade, never any white people anywhere. Mm. <clears throat> with Skyline, it was the second year Skyline had been there, and we had race riots every week, every week. Mm. 
heard about that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Those. it was. Yeah. Hey man, it was it was cold. I mean, it, they we they be throwing down in the lunchroom. I mean, food fights, fist fights. Every time we had a, a, a pep rally on Friday, they had a a, a, a student union part, and it. It was just carting off, black over here, white over here, go at it. Mm. And so my first baptism into liberation was, I was at a, um, at a pep rally and I wouldn't salute the flag. Mm. And had a principal by the name of Frank Guzik, a tall Jewish brother, he about 6'6", 230. He said, how? You didn't salute the flag. I said, why would I salute the flag, man? <laughs> None of that's about me. And, he, and this is what he said, he said, Vincent, I'm Jewish, and anything that I can do to promote Jewish kids here, I'm gonna do it. So I understand what you're doing, but you can't do it here. Mm. Mm. So first time I ever been disciplined at all in school. So how did you, so the question becomes in that regard, what is it that was in you or had you learned at that point that gave you the perspective to say that it wasn't about me? Because obviously you, had you had direct experiences, what is it that gave you that perspective? Well, I mean, I, I think, I, I think, in a way, segregation mm. kind of kept us away from a lot of that. Mm. We, didn't really have, we didn't really have to deal with white folks, and so we really didn't have to see it up front and close, you know, like that. The only time I'd ever seen it was in seventh grade, we went to a movie. It was 2001 Space Odyssey. And they took all of the people from Bow Story over there, we were seventh, eighth grade, and we went to the Inwood Theater. And we were getting loud and rowdy, and this white boy said, hey, this is not your neighborhood theater. Mm. Hey, wait a minute, hold on, hold on, you know. Uh, and so after that, I started to realize, hey, these people, you know, and everybody, you know, even older people say, that's, you know, those white kids out there, you might not be as smart as they are. Mm. I'm at the top of the class everywhere I go, what you talking about? That's what you they know? tell you. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, and, and it was, and, but it, it's, it's what, you know, it's what society tells you. And so when he told me that, I realized then, bruh, it, this is about a battle then. Then mm. it became about my pride, mm. you know? And then from then on, I, I've saluted the flag since. Mm. You know, I go to board meetings and people look at me like I'm crazy. But until the words in that Declaration of Independence or the, that particular saluting of the flag, until it's true, I'm not hold, putting my heart up. I'm a, I'm a Christian. Mm. I don't salute the Christian flag. Mm. Nobody forces me to do that. Right. Why do I have to do it to America's flag? Right. So you had, you had that kind of, um, and I'm just wondering, as you saying, you come out of a tradition of preachers and pastors, mm -hmm. so it's almost as if, you know, we know Cone with liberation theology, but you had that kind of non-conformist spirit er, at an early age, and so how did that, how did you continue to kind of nurture that? Since that happened at 15, did that mean involvement in issues? Because obviously you're already talking about a school that's racially segregated, a city that's racially divided, those tensions you were aware of. So how did you continue to kind of feed and fuel what you just shared in terms of that? You know what, and I, I, don't, think it was from, I don't think it was from the Christian side, I think it was from the hustler side. That's mm. what I thought. I used to listen to my dad talk about how, how my dad, from Thursday night until Monday morning, he was gambling. He was shooting crap the whole time, from one place to the next. That, that, was, mm. that was the bucket, I mean, that's what he did. He worked a full-time job all the time. But he used to always talk about this one white cop named Cigar. And Cigar <laughs> used to go round up a whole bunch of black people, send half of them in the paddy wagon, the ones that had some money, he'd take them on the Trinidad River Bridge and beat the hell out of them mm. and take their money. Mm. And, and you know, and, and you'd hear black, you, you, could, you could feel the tension when black people told, told you about that. You know, so just during the same time with Decker? Yeah, during the same, during the same deck area. It's, it's the same group. Yes. You know, but at that time, these white boys had complete autonomy. Mm. You know, they had uh, Henry Wade yeah. as the DA. You know, right. if there, <laughs> excuse my expression, if there was ever a no good racist cracker, that was him. <laughs> you know, and so, I mean, they just had run of the litter. You know, there were no, basically no blacks on juries. Uh, I, I remember Royce West, when he first came out, his whole thrust was basically, he was saying Black Lives Matter because he said that a black man could get killed by any other black man, spend, and that guy might spend a year in jail at most. Right. Because our, our lives didn't matter. And so from that, I, I, I mean, I, I realized that the system, it's, I was taking a civics class at the time, first at the same time all this happened. Mm. So I realized this, this system 
is not built for us, and they don't care about us. And my, grand, my dad and my grandfather were very strident. They would tell you in a minute what, they, what, what white folks couldn't do. And I think I was leaning more to that than I was uh, the 23rd Psalm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, no, and I, wasn't, and I wasn't, I wasn't suggesting maybe that it was the Christian side of it, but saying that the notion of what that meant, that's a part of the, uh, the theology that even if it has not been conveyed, mm -hmm. there's something about even your maybe even being a Christian in light of what you were exposed right, to, right? Because right, there was right. something maybe liberatory about it. Yeah. But what, what you obviously experienced from a family perspective of individuals who were one, I guess your social and emotional intelligence development, because having a father that, that moved and then understood the science of how to make money right. and how to hustle, <laughs> right. and you then being able to kind of see yeah. both sides, right? right? Having the, the which again is very reflective of kind of Jesus's environment, who yeah. he would have been around, who he would have hung out with, mm -hmm. are those who others maybe don't um, validate a certain way, exactly. but obviously have a certain level of intelligence and able to move. And, and, and to go back to that, my grandfather was a lot like this brother here. He was very much an independent businessman. He was a preacher. But he was also a real estate agent, an insurance agent, uh, and he taught school. Uh, so he always had his hustle on. Mm -hmm. but, but he was always about independence. His whole thing to me was, don't owe nobody nothing. Mm -hmm. So as long as you don't owe them, ain't nothing they can do to you. But if you owe them, they got you. Mm -hmm. and that was his, his famous words were, you owe the man, pay him. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah, you owe the man, pay him. Mm -hmm. And he was real, he was real, he was real, um, um, he was real guarded about both, uh, both of my grandfathers happen to be half white. Mm. And I don't know anybody who didn't like white people more, no more than they did. They didn't like black people either. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it was like white people left them somewhere. You know, they mm. haven't been talking about it. But uh, yeah, it, it, I just saw, I grew up with a whole lot of independence. Mm. And because I was one of the better students in that first nine years, I had a lot of independence. Right, right. I, I could walk and talk and do whatever. I could be in the hallway when, when the class was in. Cause I, I, had the, I had the grades. Mm. I get the skyline. I want to go from the ninth grade band in Ballester. We had a 140 piece marching band in the ninth grade, one of the baddest. We used to go up on the hill at Bishop, perform, knock people out. Before, the summer before we get ready to go to skyline, the white band leader sends out the word, I don't want no black people in my, in my band. Mm. And a whole lot of kids from all over. Didn't, didn't go in as a, as a result of that. Mm. But guess who he did want? Well, Don Diego. Mm. Don Diego is still a musician now. Yeah. Mm. Don Babers, that's his yeah, name. That's the name. Mm. Yeah, he did. He wanted the cream of the crop. I, as in the English journalism cluster, I went to go um, to do an interview with the coach of the football team. He said, man, I don't do, I don't do interviews with people like you. Mm. Sent a white girl down and he did it right away. Mm. The signal was out. Whether I wanted to be in the liberation movement or not, then I would put me, bro, it was, it was obvious to me. Mm. And, I, and, and to a degree, my feelings were hurt. Mm. You know, because I've always been able to get along with everybody. Mm. I've always had carte blanche. I could go wherever I wanted to. Mm. I get the white world, and this is like a stop sign. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And I'm supposed to play it? Mm. I'm supposed to put my hand over my heart and pledge? I'm mm. not, no. I couldn't tell my mama what happened, but You're right. you know, that's what happened. Right. Go ahead, Dave. No, I was yeah. just going, I don't know if it's jumping too far ahead, no. but when you mentioned about Wes, I, uh, what, uh, Ross West, I was going to ask you, like, I know he, in the time frame, like, where is it? Like, we, we spoke about him as being in the politics, you know, being in the political world now, but talk about the, like, the black people that stood up, like Al. Yeah, yeah. You know. So, so, probably, probably the, the best era we've ever had was 1986. 86. Um, West was running for DA. Uh, John had just won. Um, no, it was '84. Uh, West was running for DA. John Wiley just won. He was winning the uh, commissioner's district. A guy by the name of Jesse Alba was running against Eddie Bernice for state mm -hmm. senate. Mm -hmm. And those were all seats we had never had before. Mm -hmm. We had had gladiators like uh, like Al Lipscomb. Man, let me tell you something. Al Lipscomb. That's what I'm talking about. Hey, man, bro. Al Lipscomb was no joke. Yeah. And and in a way, he came from that hustler spirit. All the hustlers yeah. on the street knew him. <laughs> yeah. He had street cred like you wouldn't believe. Mm -hmm. You know, he only made fifty dollars a week. That's you right. know, uh, fifty dollars a meeting. But he fed eight kids mm -hmm. because a lot of black people on the street who knew him and knew that he he was doing 
he was living in his purpose, right. but he couldn't afford to, to take right. care of what he needed to, put money in his pocket. Mm. You know, because out of respect. Right. You know, the brother never did have to beg. We had um, Elsie Faye Higgins. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a name, a street name that, I mean, a bold woman. Man. I mean, this, this woman was, mm -hmm. she was snatching people in the collar before they even became uh, uh, popular. And then she basically, right after that, she was followed up by Diane Ragsdale. Mm. Nobody had ever heard about like Diane Ragsdale. Mm -hmm. Diane Ragsdale was telling white women to go to hell in, 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 in open court. I mean, loudly. Loudly. <laughs> oh, I, loudly. I can only imagine. Yeah. Right. So loud right. that she, until she got into a, with one white woman whose, whose husband was a police officer, and it was so bad, the exchange was so bad, that she got death threats for a long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were after her. So we had some, we had some people, uh, Kathleen Gillum, Kathleen I mean, Gillum. fighting like hell over there uh, for DISD students, you yeah. know. Uh, so we had, we had a whole lot of worries, but we had a mechan we had two things going for us at that particular time that this we don't have now. Mm. First of all, Oak Cliff was yeah. our center and power, th that was a power source right there. Mm. Because it was indeed one community. It right. was one community, and that's where you went to vote, and everybody tell you who to vote for, the whole nine yards. All the fights that went down, they went down there. Mm. Uh, we also had the Progressive Voters League, which mm. went all the way back to the 1920s. Um, and basically, it was where you went in, you got a civics lesson, uh, and then you got indoctrinated into politics, mm. and then they had a political wing that was out of this world. Mm. They got people elected. I'd like, to add, one more. Huh? I'd like to add one more to that, sure. that I think uh, with KKDA, with Willis and all of that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, and that was community. Yes. Yeah, Willis Johnson, uh, what's my boy's name? Uh, uh, Cousin Lenny. Cousin Lenny. That's I'll just give you a say, so Cousin Lenny. <laughs> everybody in Dallas, basically, up until the 1980s, was listening to KKDA all day, all day long. Mm. And then in, in the 80s, we were listening to KKDA and K104, their sister station. That's right. Mm. And it was a mirror effect. We, we were getting the whole thing. And, and, and that was constant community information and conversation coming good. from both of those that, stations. It was, it was more, uh, Willis had more talk mm. than he did music. That's right. Mm. He really it, did. And then John, see John had at 10 o'clock. Yeah. Was it 9 or 10 o'clock? 9 o'clock, 9 to 10. Talk back, liberation. And right he here. had everybody on there. Mm. Mm. Everybody. Everybody he can get into a fight with. Yeah. <laughs> got, into a, got into a couple of fights at the station. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but it was where people zoomed in at night to find out mm -hmm. what's going on. And, and, they, and I, I joke all the time, but part of the political power we've lost is because we were concentrated in that one area and we were kind of forced to live with each other. Mm -hmm. Now we have I, what I call the new Oak Cliff, which is Lancaster, DeSoto, right. Cedar Hill, and Duncanville. And they're wonderful communities. But if you don't catch people before they let their garage door down, you know, mm. it's a wonderful place to live, but right. it's not the kind of community we used to have. Mm. And so that, that's what's lacking. We could have anything we want in Dallas. We've always been the deciding vote. White folks don't come to us because they like us. White folks come in Dallas because they know it's going to be 50-50 white people. And if you get the black people to vote for your side, you win. Mm. See, KKDA was a uh, black podcast before podcast was. Yeah. Yeah, because mm. yeah. you had even with Cheryl Smith, you know, she was on there as well, you know, so yeah. it's like and it, everyone had their own specialty that they was dealing with. Mary Ellen Hicks. Yes. Every, I mean, we had we had um, we just had a continuum of liberation all day long. Right. And so by the time we got so by the time we got to the, to the point where we started picking it, it was that that was kind of like a report on what's actually going on. Right. So, we started out with the Dallas Police Department, mm. and a whole lot of people get it twisted. Uh, but now, what were you doing at this time? You were working with in the I was commissioner's with, office, or no? I was working for Southwestern Bell. Okay, I, I was a manager at AT and T. Right. And every every other time, every time I came to office, I had a, ma a manager say, uh, "What do you want to do for your career?" Said, Tell me, <laughs> Negro. If you keep protesting, you gonna get fired. <laughs> oh, I, had, I had a couple runs at that man. Yeah. I mean, they were after me now, for yeah. real. Uh, but but what happened was. We had gotten some complaints from uh, the residents in Pleasant Grove about police brutality. Mm -hmm. So Commissioner and another group were working together, I think John Fulham and a few other people, and they, did, they got this, the, the, the results back, and really, the young, poor white kids were catching it as much as the black kids mm -hmm. were. So we said, hey, we're going to protest against DPD. Man, when we did, we opened up a, we opened up a keg that you would never believe. The second Saturday that we were there, the white officers basically confronted the black officers 
and it we we were trying to protest, but it looked like they were trying they were gonna fight. Mm. So we try to save our protest by keeping them apart. Um, and and that's when I, that's when I met Corporal Allen. I mean, because I'm chasing that that, that yes. brother. Yes, fuck him up. Yeah, the brother, the brother. That's the brother mm -hmm. What what got me about it during all those protests? And we were out there protesting for about twelve or thirteen years, mm. five six days a week, six six in the morning to about nine. Then sometimes we come back and lunch if they made us mad. Sometimes we come back in the evening. But I saw this brother to go in, to go to his car, take off his his uh, uniform, put on a, a Black Panther jacket or something, and come out and join us on the picket line. Mm. And nobody had that kind of nerve. Mm. But we were there for so we left the police department. And then we went to Channel 8 because Dallas had this unwritten rule, this invisible contract, mm. if you will, that it wasn't going to be no black man in your, in your bedroom at, at 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> they do 6 o'clock at noon, but it was going to be 10. Didn't have very many black people in the newsroom, nothing. Uh, and so we started protesting against them. And man, that, that, that was ugly because Channel, at that time, the morning news owned Channel 8. Mm. So, Media-wise, we get our ass whooped in the paper and in print and yeah. in broadcast. Mm. Uh, but we were, and we were there for a while. We had black folks who were mad. You know, we would slow down the traffic every morning. Uh, when you came off the Jefferson Bridge, you wanted to go across in front of Dallas Morning News. We had all that blocked off. And we had black people who just lost their mind. Mm. Why don't y'all leave the white people alone so we go to work? <laughs> y'all just, just, just messing up. Yeah, and John Wiley, he crazy. I don't know why y'all be down there following John Wiley. Y'all gonna all die following John Wiley. Yeah. But, but what it was, was it was a group of committed people who had had enough. Mm. They, they ran to the same thing. I mean, in any part of living in Dallas, you can see that black folks were getting the worst. We look at statistics now, we say, yeah, uh, it, it's not your DNA, it's your, your genetic, genetic code, but it's your zip, zip code. code. It's right. always been the zip code, bro. It ain't, it ain't, that ain't never changed. Mm. And we were just tired of it being us. At, right now, zip codes on our side of the town, side of town, if you go across 30, those yeah. people live 22 years longer than the side over here. Mm. Yeah, I remember Commissioner told me that one Hey, day. man, yeah. we ought to be protesting every day. Mm. I mean, that, that, that's, that, that's crazy. So let, me, so let me ask this question in light of what you mentioned, because it's, it, it's somewhat a catch-22, like the progress of an area or area growth what does that do to now create a disbursement that that changes the commitment? Because because one of the things that you mentioned, which is what we talk about all the time, is community value system. Like you said, people are forced to live together. Mm -hmm. So then one, you had these information streams that obviously kept people informed and engaged, mm -hmm. but also there seemed to be a shared desire for better. So there was a willingness to work together. So kind of speak to what, what, what it means to now see what you're seeing in the city in terms of 67, the expansion of 35, yeah. DeSoto, Lancaster, Duncanville. Well, you know, uh, in, in a lot of ways, uh, dispersing to these bedroom communities was good for a lot of us. The initial thing that happened is when we moved to Oak Cliff, it wasn't that bad in South Dallas. But when we moved to Oak Cliff to Duncanville and the new Oak Cliff, it be, all we left were single women with children and a, a elderly adults. And there's nobody there. A, at the time, it's, it's hard to believe it now because you can buy liquor everywhere. At the time, yes. you, can buy, you could only buy liquor in about 13 different areas. That's and right. South Dallas was, was the, the biggest one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It had th uh, uh, like 1,300 liquor-related yeah. businesses in a six-square-mile area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what that, what that creates is that's where you dump it. Because wherever people go to get their drink, they go to get their smokes, mm -hmm. they go to get... Uh, Them little girls. Get, get girls. <laughs> Come on down yard. And so that's what it, it becomes a red light district. Mm -hmm. yes. And so what happened was, as we progressed, we segregated ourselves, even by family, and it left, it left that hole there. And so, and you can still see that in the farther parts of South Dallas. And it, it really was something in West Dallas, but you know, when the, the mayor, they had the thing go, go south, that campaign, what they did was go west. Mm. They put all their money in West Dallas and mm. ran all the black people out of there, mm. and everything you see is brand new. Mm. So yeah, it, it, you you would you would hope that uh, we could maintain community, but in a lot of ways we have we have mm. done even even between those four cities, if Lancaster, DeSoto, Cedar Hill, and uh, Duncanville 
put their, their, their resources together, it'd be unbelievable. The, now, they did in one case. You know what they got? What? They got a jail. <laughs> mm. They got a jail. All three of them using DeSoto. <laughs> mm. They put a jail together. But other than that, We can't really? put nothing together to keep people away from we, it. We can't have a super library. We can't have a huge amphitheater. We can't have a great big, huge uh, baseball diamond for the kids. Hey, man. Community if we center. Can, if, if we can do the Tri-Cities Jail, we can do the Quad Cities, whatever else we want to. Mm. We can make a, a, a great big Sankofa where right. everybody come and eat healthy. We don't do that. And so what, what, what we got into was instead of, instead of keeping that, that unity to that degree, we're so happy to be called the mayor of X <laughs> city mm. that we're, you know, I got to take care of my city, mm. Negro. Them same people you just left, they, they were with you in South Dallas 20 years ago. Mm. It's the same people. So, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to do. And, and, with, and without, social media is good, but it's nothing like those radio stations were. Yeah. And of course, when y'all got good at, at, at radio, they got rid of it. Mm. AM is gone, FM is at, slated to go out in three years. Mm. Mm. Well, so, so let me ask this last final, final question, obviously, and there's so much more to be said, so much more uh, to be shared. And as I say all the time, I'm learning so much about Dallas, you know, obviously. Stuff, bro. Appreciate uh, that hearing from uh, both of you all. So lastly, what would be three things in light of what you just mentioned, in light of the state of things in Texas, what would be three things that we need to be taking into consideration prior to the next election, but also currently now, when it comes to how things still are disproportionate um, in South Dallas? So I think the first thing, and you and I talked about this this weekend, we need a civics class. We, uh, black people don't, Black people understand basketball, football, golf. We know all the rules to all the games. We don't know the rules of politics. We don't know the difference in who's what, who's who. We don't know what they do. We don't know what they're supposed to do. We got to have, we got to, we got to at least impart to our children what it is. Uh, for the most part, we know about the police, but we don't know about the differences in, in, in how that structure is built up. Uh, the second thing we got to do is we got to decide whether we're going to be a wholly owned subsidiary of ourselves or we're going to merge with the bigger power. The number just came out, and now Hispanics are the largest population in Texas. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? That, you know, I, I sit on two major boards right now, DFW Airport Board and Parkland Board. And we talk a lot about MWBE, but for the most part, it's Hispanic. Mm -hmm. We're still not getting that. We're still not getting our just. The state of Texas is only doing 2% um, contracts to black people, 4 or 5% to Hispanics. But, but what people never flip the number and realize that if, if minorities are only getting 7% of trillions of dollars, that means white man is getting 93%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and even the white men know that ain't fair. Right, right. Yeah, that's why they closed down DEI. That's why they did that. So we got to do that. And then the other thing is that we have got to figure out how to get control of our educational system. We don't have the money to create our own charters, but we gotta go back in these school districts. It's just like, just like what's going on in Houston. Right. You know, that's, that's unbelievable. Right. Right. You know, uh, everybody ought to be mad about that. They basically came in, commandeered their whole system mm. and, 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 and put up a man that we ran out of Dallas. It mm. took us four or five years to get that boy out of here. That's that right. dude, he was, he was Poison from the time he got here. Mm. So uh, we, 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 let, me, let me sum it up all together. We got to start dealing with policy, not with personality, not with nothing. Policy. What does the policy say? When it's all said and done, if we don't take care of policy, are, are, we, at the, uh, are we at the junction where we need to make a certain amount of marijuana legal? Maybe so. Because we still got people who go to jail for that. Mm -hmm. And we can, we can raise all the cans we want to, but I can still take you down to jail right now and show you something down there. Right. You know? So we, we, got, we, got to get we got to concentrate on policy and how that's making a difference. Mm. And once we do that and, that and understanding our money, we'll be okay. But we, got to, we have too much free time for TikTok and everything else, and we don't know anything about we, we major in the minors and minor in the majors. Mm. All right. Still there. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Hall, for coming by and sharing. And, and, and I just want to thank you, brothers, especially for creating this forum, but also for what you, what you do and for what you believe. Because there are a whole lot of people who think about liberation, very few people 
believe that can be accomplished. So I'm, I'm just glad to be with you guys. Appreciate you. Thank you, brother. Yes, Appreciate sir. It. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. It. Thank you all for joining us for another edition of COPA Conversations, and we look forward uh, to the next time that we should get together. Peace. Peace. Right on.